Hello everyone and welcome to this second online tutorial. Uh, today I want to go through um, assignment number two. Uh, this is of course intended for students of uh, UCD doing the physics course PHYC 30070. So we'll go through the questions in assignment two and the full worked solutions to those questions. So this assignment is about electrostatics. And in question one, we're discussing the physics of charged planes. So part A starts off asking us to uh, discuss, in the context of electrostatics, uh, the uniqueness theorem. So the uniqueness theorem states that there is a single or unique solution to the Poisson equation in electrostatics, which is that the Laplacian of the scalar potential V is equal to minus the charge density over epsilon naught, um, in a given region of space containing a given charge distribution, rho of r, which is consistent with the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions, in this case, of course, means just the value of the potential, v of r, on the surface bounding the specified region of interest. So again, the idea of the uniqueness theorem is that there's only one solution with a given charge density and given boundary conditions. And what this means is that if we somehow stumble upon a solution of the Poisson equation for a given charge distribution that does satisfy the boundary conditions, then it must be right, independently of how we obtained it. And furthermore, because we're only considering a particular region of space, notice that the Poisson equation is a differential equation and therefore applies pointwise everywhere in space, then we can apply the Poisson equation in a given region of space with a given charge distribution without caring what's going on in the rest of the universe. So, for example, uh, the rest of uh, the world that we consider might have a different charge density with different fields and so on, and we don't care about that. We're only interested in a given region of space. And as long as the boundary conditions are satisfied, then the solution must be correct. And this allows us actually to do many um, ingenious things in the study of electrostatics. For example, in uh, application of the method of images, and there, for example, we can replace a complex charge distribution in uh, a conductor uh, with simple image charges. As long as the boundary conditions are satisfied, then we can replace the physical system by a simpler system to obtain the correct solution. Okay, so we're only asked for a brief discussion, so that will suffice. Okay, let's look at part B. Okay, so we're given Gauss's law, that's the electric field flux through some vector area bounding a particular volume is equal to the charge enclosed inside that volume divided by epsilon naught. And we're asked to show, using this equation, that the electric field immediately above and below a charged surface undergoes a discontinuity, which is proportional to the charge density in the surface. OK, so we're asked to prove this. So at the start of every question, we should draw a quick diagram indicating uh, what's going on in our system. This is a little sketch of our plane which carries a charge density sigma, and I want to construct a Gaussian surface on this, uh, on this plane. Um, which I can consider the uh, field flux through uh, when looking at Gauss's law. So let me just annotate this little box with some dimensions. Let's consider this dimension here to be uh, delta x, uh, this height here to be delta z, and this width to be, you guessed it, delta y. So this, is, uh, this red thing that I've drawn here is a Gaussian surface. And um, we're imagining that uh, it's very, very narrow. 
So delta z is small. And we have an area which is just delta x, delta y. That's the, that's the top area of the box. Okay, so we can apply um, Gauss's law. We need to take the electric field flux through um, the vector area. Now, because we let delta z to be something that's very, very small, only electric field lines are going to be passing through um, the this, this sort of top and the bottom of this little Gaussian uh, surface box that I've drawn here. And so we can easily extract um, the solution to this uh, electric field flux integral. It's going to be the area times the perpendicular component of the field uh, above minus the perpendicular component of the field below. And the relative minus sign there is coming from the fact that the electric field lines are going to be pointing um, outwards from everywhere from the surface. If we have some charge located on the surface, then the field lines are going to be um, sort of pointing like this on the top, but coming out in the opposite direction underneath. And as we make the surface area of the top and bottom of this box smaller and smaller, we can actually neglect the curvature of the plane. Okay, so that's the left-hand side of Gauss's law. On the right-hand side, we know it's the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught, um, which, of course, is the charge density per unit area times the area A divided by epsilon naught. And, of course, the whole point is that these areas cancel, and we're left with something that applies uh, point-wise. You can also think of this as sort of shrinking the, the uh, surface area of this box down to zero, as I mentioned. And so what we have uh, is, therefore, that E perpendicular above minus E perpendicular below is equal to sigma upon epsilon naught, which is what we set out to prove. Again, the argument for this being the perpendicular component is we consider this Gaussian pillbox, this Gaussian uh, surface that we've constructed here, with a very, very narrow uh, walls so that there's no field lines passing through those things. So by construction, we're considering something where the electric field lines are just coming perpendicular to the surface. And as we make the area smaller and smaller, we can apply this pointwise on the surface, even independently of any curvature on the surface. Good. So that tells us about the perpendicular component. Uh, the second part of uh, the question asks us to show that um, there's not any discontinuity in the parallel parts of the field. So this is the electric field parallel to the surface. Apparently, this is the same above and below uh, the surface. So we can prove that using um, the other identity that we're given in part B of the question, namely that the line integral of the electric field around a closed loop is equal to zero. So how would we use that? So we're able to use this second um, identity. Let's draw our little sketch again. So we consider some surface. And again, it has some charge density sigma. And what we want to do now is consider a line integral, a closed loop line integral. How should we do that? Imagine that I consider the following path. So if I'm gonna do a line integral, I need to specify a particular path. So let's consider a part of this closed loop, closed loop path that extends above the surface and a part that extends below the surface. Okay, something like this. And we can break this down into two pieces. There's the part of the path that's up uh, above the surface and there's the part of the path that's below the surface. Again, let me annotate this diagram slightly. Let me 
say that this length here is a length delta z, and that this length here is a length delta x. Um, so again, we can play the same trick of making delta z very small, so that the contributions to the line integral uh, will be vanishingly small due to the vertical components here, just because I'm making the path length extremely small. So let's employ the equation, which is that we have a closed loop line integral of the electric field around some path. We can break that down into the parts of the path that's above the surface and the parts of the path that's below the surface. And um, the closed loop line integral in electrostatics is equal to zero. Um, just a note for aficionados, in dynamics, of course, it's not necessarily equal to zero um, because of Faraday's law. Okay, but in electrostatics, it's definitely true that the closed loop line integral equals zero. And so what we know is that these two integrals that I've written down here um, must cancel in order to have this equal zero. And we haven't really specified much about the path, so this must be a general result. So we learnt that if we take the parallel part of the field above the plane, dx, that must be equal to the parallel part of the field below the plane, dx. Why am I saying that it's the parallel part? Because we have a, pa a part that's parallel to the, pla to the plane, and we have a part of the path that's perpendicular to the plane, but I've made dz very small, so I'm sending that part of the path to be um, of very, very short length, so it doesn't really contribute to the integral. So the part of the integral I'm integrating along dx is, is the part that's parallel to the plane. And indeed, as I make the path lengths, length delta x smaller and smaller, um, again, we can neglect any curvature in the plane, and this becomes precise. Um, so this applies for any delta x, any path that we take, and therefore that implies that the electric field itself above the plane is equal to electric field itself below the plane. So there's no discontinuity in the parallel component of the electric field, but there is a discontinuity in the perpendicular uh, component of the electric field across a charged plane. OK, so let's proceed now to part C of the question. Um, as we'll see, part C uses the information that we've just derived in the previous parts of the question. So this is very common in especially exam style questions. And in fact, this is a previous exam paper question. Um, so the first parts of the question set up some of the basic stuff that you need to know to apply it in the last part of the question. The last part of the question is more difficult and is worth more marks. Part C, consider an infinite grounded metal sheet in the xy plane at z equals naught with a point charge plus q located at a position r vector is 0, 0, d. Finds the induced surface charge in the metal sheet sigma of x and y and the total induced charge q induced, which is the integral of that thing over the plane. So this is a proper physics question and uh, if you were just given this out of the blue, you might be struggling a little bit to think about how to go about solving this. Um, but the previous parts of the question have really set up uh, the scene for us. In particular, that part A was talking about the uniqueness theorem, and an example of the uniqueness theorem, as we said in our answer, was the method of images. And this is going to be an application of the method of images in part C. Also, in part B, we were talking about how a charged plane has an electric field discontinuity in the perpendicular direction. Again, we're going to be using that fact. OK, so let's get into action. So first of all, let's analyse the physical situation. 
we have an infinite, so the physical situation is that we have an infinite grounded metal plane. So the fact that it's grounded means that I can imagine attaching like a little uh, uh, wire here and connecting it to ground. What does, what consequence does grounding the metal sheet have? What does that mean? It means that um, it has a constant potential that we're going to set equal to zero. That's the, that's what grounding the the, the metal plane does. And um, of course, because we have this metal sheet and the metal is a conductor, it's an equipotential. So everywhere in this conductor has the same potential. And if we connect it to ground, that potential will be equal to zero. Of course, um, the reference point for a potential is somewhat arbitrary, but uh, by tradition, we call uh, the ground V equals naught. So the whole plane must be V equals naught. Now, already, this is suggesting something about the uniqueness theorem, because application of the uniqueness theorem involves boundary conditions. And here, what we're saying is that the value of the potential is exactly zero in this entire infinite plane. So that's a boundary condition. Right, so that's one thing to note. The second thing is we have an additional point charge located here. Uh, it's a point charge plus Q, and that is a distance away from this plane uh, in this perpendicular direction of D. Okay, fine. So what do we expect to happen in the conductor? Before we get down to the maths, what happens in the conductor due to this uh, nearby charge plus Q? Well, the electrons in the metal are mobile because it's a conductor and they will rearrange themselves inside the metal to uh, arrange it so that the, the uh, conductor is at a constant potential V equals zero and that means they must sort of count, cancel the electric field effects of this nearby charge plus Q or put it another way the electrons will be in the plane will be drawn close to this positive charge plus Q uh, by the attractive uh, Coulomb force. And so you can imagine a high density of uh, electrons um, as close as it can get to the plus Q, which is, uh, which is a distance that's, of course, just sort of perpendicular. Um, and then as we go away, there'll be a smaller and smaller density of conduction electrons. So there'll be a, a sort of pile up of charge at the closest point because those charges are attracted to this, plus, this nearby plus Q. And the exact distribution of those charges is actually rather complicated and it will adjust itself um, in such a way to give an overall potential for the plane V equals naught. So to work this out from first principles appears to be an extremely difficult job. Um, however, we actually utilise the method of images, which is nothing more than an application of the uniqueness theorem. And in the method of images, we replace this physical system by a fictitious system. The fictitious system is two point charges, one at one with a charge minus Q and one with a charge plus Q. And those charges are a distance 2D away from each other. So here's D, here's another D. And that's it. So there's no infinite grounded metal plane. There's just two point charges. And the reason why we choose this auxiliary system is that if we just look at the half uh, plane, which is, uh, if we're looking in this direction, that's z greater than zero. So in this system, that would be looking in this direction, that's z greater than zero. If we just look in the direction z greater than zero, then we will just see a single uh, point charge plus Q located at a distance D. So 
the charge density for the scenario on the left, the physical scenario, in this half plane z greater than zero, is the same as the charge density of our auxiliary system in the half plane z greater than zero. And moreover, because we have a plus q and a minus q uh, located either side of z equals zero, we'll see by symmetry that the potential will exactly vanish along this black dotted line that I've drawn here. So for z equals zero, the potential will vanish. And that's the boundary condition that we want in the physical system. And the uniqueness theorem tells us that if we're just interested in the potential for z greater than zero, then this auxiliary system must give us the right answer. Why? Because there's only one answer. And this one has the correct charge distribution and the correct boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the idea. So let's actually put this into action now and, um, and work out the actual potential and then the electric field. And then with it, we'll work out the charge density. So first of all, we have the law of superposition for the potential. We have that the total potential V is the potential due to the, the charge plus Q and the potential due to the charge um, minus Q, which I'm calling V plus and V minus, where the potentials V plus or minus as a function of R are given by plus or minus Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, and then s plus minus. So the charges are plus or minus q. They're point charges, and we know the potential that's due to a point charge q. It's q over 4 pi epsilon naught, and then the distance between the point charge and the, uh, the field point where we're interested in knowing the potential. And I'm calling that here s plus or minus. So this is the distance away for our point R from our point charge. So that's S plus or minus by Pythagoras. Let's look at the square of it for convenience. It's going to be X squared plus Y squared. But the distance along Z is uh, shifted because the point charge is not equal uh, is not at z equals naught. It's at z equals d. So we have z minus plus d squared. So just to sort of try to clarify what I'm talking about, imagine I consider a point here which is r x, which is a point x y z. I want to know what the distance is. Um, between the point charge and this uh, and this point, this uh, field point here, and so we need to work out. Um, so R, let, let's write down that R of plus is equal to zero zero d. Then by vector addition, we can work out that vector that I've drawn in green there, uh, and then we can work out the length of that vector using Pythagoras' theorem. And that's what this s plus minus is. OK, so that's what we have. Um, so that's everything we actually need. Let's just write down, therefore, the full potential of the system. We have a common factor of q over 4 pi epsilon naught. I guess this is a big Q here, I should write. OK. Of 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z minus d squared. And then minus, and it's minus because we have a minus charge uh, on the other side of the plane, z squared, uh, so the, the distance squared, sorry, is x squared plus y squared plus z plus d squared. 
So that's the exact potential, and that's it done. And we argue by the uniqueness theorem that this is the exact potential um, for also the physical system um, And by physical system, I mean the one involving the uh, grounded plane for z greater than zero. Um, we can also see from this expression directly that v of x, y, and z equals zero is equal to zero. It satisfies the correct boundary condition. That's because if I put z equals zero in this expression, I have a minus d squared in the first term and a plus d squared in the second term. They're the same and the two terms cancel. So this satisfies the boundary condition. And in for z equals uh, z greater than zero, we have the same charge density in the physical system as in our auxiliary system, namely a single point charge located at zero, zero d. So this is all good. We have the exact potential. What I now want to know is not what the potential is, but what the um, the induced charge density sigma is. So let's see uh, what we get. Well, in part B of the question, we were at pains to work out that the electric field above and below um, a charged plane is related to this sigma. And that's what we want. And therefore, by symmetry, um, the electric field perpendicular to the plane as a function of position x and y in the plane, and z goes to zero just on the positive side which I'll indicate as this limiting process, z goes to zero plus. That means it's infinitesimally positive, but approaching zero. So this will give us the charge density as a full function of position in the plane x and y, z is equal to zero in the plane, divided by two epsilon. Okay, but we don't actually know the electric field. We know the potential so to get uh, a relationship between the potential and the electric field, um, we just think about what the definition of the potential is in terms of electric field. Uh, we get the electric field by taking minus the gradient of the potential. And so we can extract um, the charge density sigma as minus two epsilon dv uh, by dz, and this is to be evaluated as z goes to zero, slightly on the positive side. The potential is, of course, continuous everywhere, and so there's no problem taking the derivative um, of the potential and then looking at it as z goes to zero. So the fact that the potential is continuous means we can take derivatives. So I need to take the derivative allowing for different z's and then at the end set this to z equals zero and that's going to give me the charge density. So this formula I've written down here is basically just coming from the fact that the electric field is minus the gradient of the potential and we know the electric field is only varying in the perpendicular direction. So I have to take a derivative with respect to z. Okay, so that's fine. We now just have to go ahead and calculate the derivatives it's a bit of a pain, but I leave it up to you to uh, convince yourselves this is the case. Um, we have to use, uh, we have two terms, so we have two derivatives to do. And we get this. And then the second term is on the top, z plus d. And on the bottom, z 
said plus d squared. And that whole thing we need then to set z goes to zero, or sends that to zero as a limiting process. <clears throat> and that makes it rather simple, because as I send z goes to zero uh, on the bottom, those two bottom terms become the same. And as I send z goes to zero on the top, the, um, the d's cancel. And what I'm left over with in the end is a very simple relation. Um, which is our final result. So we're asked to find out the charge density in the plane, and it takes this form. Now, that's not something I think you could guess. So this method of images is giving us a very sophisticated and complicated result um, very cheaply, very easily to do this. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so in the first part of question two, um, we're asked to uh, use and apply Gauss's law. The first part says state Gauss's law. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Gauss's law tells us that the electric field flux through some uh, surface of a bounded region is equal to the charge enclosed in that region divided by epsilon naught. Um, and then it says in the question that we should use Gauss's law to work out the electric field around a wire with a uniform line charge density lambda. Use cylindrical coordinates, it says, and assume the wire is infinitely long and thin. So we're going to have a, a translational invariance along the wire, and there's a certain symmetry associated with that that we're going to utilize. Um, as always, we start with a sketch. And um, here is the wire, and this wire has on it, apparently, some constant line charge density uh, lambda in 1D. We're going to want to apply Gauss's law, which means we need to do a surface integral. So I need to pick a region and um, such that we can do an integral over the boundary surface of this, of the electric field. And that surface is called a Gaussian surface. And an appropriate one to choose for a system with cylindrical symmetry is a coaxial cylinder. Um, coaxial meaning that it has the same uh, uh, axis as the wire. So here I've drawn in a sort of sketch of our Gaussian surface. Um, and this is the surface uh, over which I'm going to integrate the electric field. The integral I have to do involves a vector area, it's dA vector, and so it doesn't just mean that we integrate over the surface, it means that at every point on the surface we have an associated vector that points normal to the surface and, by convention, pointing out from the bounded volume. Uh, that's clearly going to be, in, in these um, cylindrical coordinates, the radial vector. Um, let's draw on here um, a radius for this Gaussian cylinder, um, which is uh, conventionally called S in, uh, in cylindrical coordinates. So by symmetry, we have that the electric field should be something that is only pointing radially, and the magnitude of that is something that only depends on the radius. So what I've written down here is an equation, the electric field is E subscript s of s in the s hat direction actually contains quite a lot of information. And we're getting that from the symmetry of the situation. 
So because of the translational symmetry down the wire and the rotational symmetry around the wire, we cannot have a theta or a phi dependence to the magnitude of the electric field. Um, and indeed, it must be pointing uh, radially outwards from the charge density, which is uh, along the axis. So the symmetry really tells us quite a bit in this problem, and we're going to utilize that in uh, application of Gauss's law. So let's do it. Um, we have to take the integral around this Gaussian surface of the electric field Um, and then we have to dot this electric field into the vector area dA. However, the vector area dA is, uh, the, the direction of that vector area is also radial. So let me add that to our symmetry list here, that dA vector is equal to S hat dA. The vector normal to the surface at every point is S hat the unit vector. Good. And then in this equation here, of course, we see s dot s. Uh, they both the unit vectors, so that's equal to 1. And so the fact that we've picked um, our Gaussian surface uh, judiciously such that the direction of the electric field everywhere along the Gaussian surface is parallel to the unit vector normal to that surface means that we can get rid of the vectors. Now we're just left with a scalar integral, which is certainly easier. Furthermore, because the electric field only depends radially, or the strength of the electric field only depends uh, radially, or on the radial distance away from the wire, um, we know that because the Gaussian surface has a constant radius, s, that the electric field, es of s, is a constant across the Gaussian surface. And so I can actually take it out of the integral. And then I just have the integral of the, uh, of the area of the Gaussian surface. So I have ES of S times what? Well, it's the area of a cylinder, 2 pi S times the length I didn't indicate the length on the diagram. Let's say that this is a length L. Well, that's it. And that's the left-hand side of Gauss's law. And on the right-hand side, we know that this is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. What is the charge enclosed? Um, well, much of the uh, enclosed space of the Gaussian surface is empty space. It's only the, the wire itself that carries a charge. And that has a 1d line charge density of lambda. So the total charge is just lambda times the length L. And that has to be divided by epsilon naught in Gauss's law. So you see nicely that the L's cancel left and right. And so finally, we can extract the electric field. The magnitude of the electric field simply as lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught s. We can reinstate the vectors. The electric field at a field point R is therefore lambda upon 2 pi epsilon naught s in the s hat direction. Tick. Okay, we're not quite finished yet. We've worked out the electric field, but we're also asked to work out the um, potential, the electrostatic potential. And we can do that by taking um, the integral of the electric field along some path, specifically the potential at some point or some radial distance away from the wire s minus a reference potential will be equal to minus the integral from whatever origin we're talking about, from whatever reference point, up to a radius s of the electric field dot dl integrated along some path. And this can be done via any path because 
the scalar potential is a state function rather than a path function. The value of this integral, somewhat miraculously, doesn't depend on the path taken, only the start and end points. So we can take any path, and of course that freedom means that we can choose a nice path that we want to choose. In particular, the electric field that we've just worked out uh, is in the radial direction, it just depends on s hat. So why don't we take our path to be parallel to this direction, also along s hat? So we're going to choose the path dl to be um, s hat along the ds direction. Um, I better call this s primed because I'm already using s uh, on the left hand side of the equation. Uh, that's just a dummy index that we're going to integrate over anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, so now I have the integral from some reference point to s of e s of s primed d s primed. I've contracted out the vectors. I had an s hat dot s hat equals 1. And furthermore, I can substitute in the actual value of the electric field strength that we've worked out just a moment ago. And this is an easy one to do. And we end up with the following results. That the potential evaluated at a radius s minus a reference potential is equal to minus lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught times log of s over the, uh, the reference point um, radius. Now, what we'd like is for the reference point um, potential to equal 0. And we see that that is achieved by setting um, the radius of this reference point just equal to 1. We have log of 1 that is equal to 0. So this s of the reference point is equal to 1. And then I can just write the final result. that the uh, potential at a, uh, a radius s is minus lambda upon 2 pi epsilon naught times log of s. So um, we've explained the, we've not only have we calculated the electric potential, but it was also we've um, explained our choice of the reference point, um, which is just to um, have the, the reference potential equal to zero. This is a somewhat minor point, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, we know that physical properties don't depend on our choice of reference point, so we can really choose it anything that we want. Uh, we could have chosen it to be something else here, uh, but the convenient thing is to choose it so that the reference potential vanishes, which we get here from choosing the reference point at s equals 1. Okay, so moving on to part b of question 2. State and explain the principle of superposition in electrostatics. So the principle of superposition tells us that the potential at a point is the sum of the potentials for each source in isolation. So we can imagine decomposing the total potential, let's call that V total, into the sum of contributions V1, V2, V3, and so on, where V1 would be the potential at that point due to some particular source in the absence of any other sources. V2 would be the potential at that point due to um, source number two in the absence of any other sources, and so on. And in particular, those sources could be point charges. In particular, we can break down a continuum charge distribution into its contributions from uh, individual point charges. So with this uh, expression, um, we can also obviously derive that the total electric field can be thought of as the electric field due to 
individual contributions from individual sources. And notice that this, of course, now is a vector sum. So this is the principle of superposition, and it basically arises because Maxwell's equations are linear differential equations. So any linear combination of solutions to Maxwell's equations are also solutions to Maxwell's equations. So what this means is that I can think of, for example, um, solving Maxwell's equations for some particular uh, charge density, and then I can solve Maxwell's equations from, for some different charge density. And then if I add up those solutions, I know that that's the correct electric field for the sum of the original charge distributions. So this is an extremely useful and powerful result. This is, as I mentioned, due to the linearity of Maxwell's equations. Good. OK, let's have a look at uh, part two. Using your answer to part A of the question, which we just did, um, find the potential V due to two such infinite wires. So we previously we considered the, the potential due to a, a single wire. Now we're considering two wires. These two wires lie in the xy plane. One of them is running along the x-axis and the other is running along the y-axis and they intersect at the origin at z equals zero. Both of these wires have the same uh, line charge density lambda. So the idea is that we've already worked out the potential due to a single wire, and so we can use the superposition law to construct the potential due to two wires. Okay, so what's the potential due to... So we can say that the total potential as a function of x, y, z is equal to the potential, let's call it number 1, as a function of x, y, z, plus the potential of wire number two. Let's say that this one is running along the x-axis, and this is along the y-axis. So let's draw a quick sketch. We have one wire here, let's call that number one, and then we have another wire here running number two, and then this is the, the, the z-axis, this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. Okay, and um, we can work out for wire number one parallel to the x-axis, we can work out the potential v1 using the previous result. That we obtained. We found that it was minus lambda upon 2 pi epsilon naught of the log of, and here previously we had s, which was the radial distance from the wire. Now here we can't use cylindrical coordinates for both of the two wires because the axis of the cylinder would be different for the two wires. So we need to convert this into Cartesian coordinates. I've emphasized this by saying on the left-hand side that the potential is a function of x, y, and z. So we need to work out what is the radial distance away from wire number one in Cartesian coordinates. And the answer is something simple that we get from Pythagoras. It's just y squared plus z squared it's the wire is parallel to x so it doesn't so the distance uh, the perpendicular distance the radial distance away from the wire doesn't depend on x but it does depend as you can see from the diagram on uh, y and z in exactly this way good and then we have the second wire which is parallel to the y hat direction 
that's v2. And by exactly the, the same token, we can write this as minus lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught log of, and then we have to again write the perpendicular distance, but this time away from wire number 2, and that's just going to be square root of x squared plus z squared. There's no y dependence because the wire runs along the y-axis. So I can find now the total potential by adding these up. Um, I will take out a factor of uh, a half out of the log, which corresponds to the, the square roots, and write this as minus lambda upon 4 pi epsilon naught. And I'll also add these two logs together, which means I can take the product of their arguments, which gives me y squared plus z squared into x squared plus z squared. Okay, so that's the exact result. And we can evaluate this at um, a couple of different points as requested in the question in part three. I'll just do this, it's very quick, so I'll just do this in this little box down here. In part three of the question, we have to work out what v of 0, 0, d is. So what this means is we've got to evaluate the potential at x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals d. So um, I just look at my exact expression for any x, y, z down here. I set x and y to 0, then I get a factor of log z to the 4, where z equals d. So overall, I'm going to get minus lambda to over 4 pi epsilon naught log of d to the 4. Now, again, I can use the properties of logs to take the power of d here out of the log, which will cancel with the 1 quarter, giving me minus lambda log d over pi epsilon naught, which is indeed what we're asked to prove. Good, so we're on the right tracks. It also says, and this is something we were a little bit careless with actually in part two of the question, it says with a reference point for the potential at r equals zero, zero, one. So we didn't actually specify a potential, uh, a reference for the potential in part two of the question. Um, but here we can specify one. And if, uh, if we're looking at a potential at x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals one, that's a special case of the equation that I've written down here in part three with d equals one, um, log one is equal to zero. So indeed, um, the reference to the potential is equal to zero at this, uh, at this point. So the answer I've given there is already the correct result for uh, this reference point to the potential. Okay, then it also says find v of d d zero and just by plugging x equals d, y equals d, and z equals d into the full solution, we can easily see that we get the same thing, minus lambda log d over pi epsilon naught. So both of those results are in fact the same. Okay, so in the last part of this uh, sub-question, find an expression for the potential in the plane with x equals y. Now, this might seem a bit confusing. What is the plane with x equals y? Well, we can draw a line, x equals y. Everyone knows how to do that. And then this is a plane when we consider that uh, this line exists for any z in the vertical direction. So that's the plane in question. And, uh, but we actually don't really need to even think too hard about it because we know the full expression for the potential at x, y, and z is equal precisely to um, minus lambda upon 4 pi epsilon naught log y squared plus z squared, just to recapitulate this, into x squared plus z squared. Therefore, if I write down the potential at x equals y, then I'll just write x and x and z. 
So here I've set y is equal to x. And that's going to be minus lambda upon 4 pi epsilon naught times log of x squared plus z squared times x squared plus z squared again. So I put a square up here. I can bring that square out using the properties of logs. And that gives me this result. We're now asked to give the equation of lines in this plane along which v is constant. So here's the full expression for v. So we just set this equal to some constant. So um, we need to find lines uh, in the uh, x equals y plane, uh, where x and z are chosen <coughs> such that this expression is a constant. It says sketch these equipotential lines and in the same diagram sketch the electric field lines. Okay, so we'll get on to electric field lines in a moment, but first of all, let's consider um, the equipotential lines. Equipotential lines, of course, mean lines of constant potential, and that's the equation that we've just written down. So when is the potential constant? Well, it's obviously when x squared plus z squared is a constant, and let's call that r squared. These are basically uh, circles with radius r. So it's easy to sketch such a thing. Um, there's a little caveat in the sketch. Let's plot as a function of z and x. This x here is actually also the y direction. So this line, this axis that I've drawn here, is actually the x equals y direction. Good. Um, so in this plane, maybe I'll extend it over here as well and down. What I want to do is draw equipotential lines, and they will be lines of constant uh, radius r in this diagram. So I will have circles basically like this. Okay, this is a terrible sketch, but um, you get the idea. So this one here, for example, has r equals 1, this is r equals 2, this is r equals 3, and so on. And for a given r, with r squared equals x squared plus z squared, uh, we have a constant potential. And what is the potential? v is equal to minus uh, lambda log r upon pi epsilon naught for a given radius r. Okay, so that's it. Um, one little caveat, though, is because the, uh, the horizontal axis in my diagram here is actually the line x equals y, if I were to plot uh, these things in the x, y, z plane, there would actually be ellipses rather than circles. So have a little think about that. Okay, how do we get the electric field? The electric field is minus the gradient of the potential, and so we just need to take the derivative. And as usual, when we're taking the, the gradient uh, here, is the gradient operator, it's a vector, and therefore the electric field um, lines go along the lines of steepest ascent of the uh, equipotential lines. So all I do is draw the lines for the electric field that are everywhere perpendicular to the equipotential lines. So lines that sort of look like this. So they're lines that actually turn out to be uh, radial through this plane. And so on, you get the idea. And these lines are meant to be passing through the center. So these things that are drawn here are exactly the electric field lines, and the red things are the equipotential lines. So again, just remember that electric field lines are perpendicular to equipotential lines.
uh, because um, the electric field are the lines of steepest ascent, sort of down the hill, if you like, of these contour lines uh, given by the uh, lines of constant potential. In part C of the question, we're asked now to consider two long thin wires running parallel to the z-axis. One has a uniform line charge density of plus lambda, the other one with minus lambda, and uh, they're at positions x equals plus a and minus a, respectively. Okay, so as usual, we should, of course, draw a sketch. Let me draw it over here to save some space. Uh, so we have something like this. Um, this one has charge density minus lambda. This one has charge density plus lambda. And they're a distance 2a away from each other. So this is the z-axis running up this way. And um, this is the sort of x equals 0 line here through the middle. And what we want to know, first of all, is, of course, the potential. And the potential, which is just going to be a function of x and y, because um, we have translational invariance in the z direction as we just run up and down the wires, we have a potential x and y that, as usual, is obtained from the law of superposition. So again, we can write this in terms of the potentials that we've already calculated for the, um, the single wire. And again, we just have to be a bit careful here by what we mean by the radial distance from a wire. And the reason why we have to be careful is that we can't use cylindrical coordinates for both wires simultaneously. They have different axes. And so um, we just need to uh, remember that the radial distance from one of the wires is from Pythagoras equal to x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared square rooted um, for an origin which has been shifted to x naught y naught. And here we know that the wires have been shifted, uh, one of them to x equals minus a, and the other one to x equals plus a. So we can just plug that in, and we can obtain um, expressions for v. Let, let's call these v plus and minus, actually. That's easier, isn't it? So we'll relabel v1 as v plus, and we'll relabel v2 here as uh, v minus. Uh, good. OK, so V plus minus is going to be the charge density, so it's going to be minus plus lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught of the log. And then it's the square root of x minus plus a squared plus y squared. So if you think about it, what's written here in the log is the radial distance from uh, the wires either plus or minus. If it's uh, the wire with the, the plus charge density, then um, that's a wire that's running through the point x equals plus a, and so I need to shift the origin uh, to, so we see in, in the radial distance there, the factor x minus a squared plus y squared. Good. Um, so we just add those together and find the total potential, which is going to be V. I'll tidy this up a little bit and write this in the following way. And then on the bottom, it'll be X minus A squared plus y squared. And again, I'm using the properties of the logs here. Log of a minus log of b is equal to log a over b. And that's the simplification of the answer required in part one of the question. Okay, so part two says, for this system, the equipotential lines 
where v is equal to v0 is a constant, are circles in the xy plane centered on xy is equal to x0 and 0 with radius r0. So what we've got to do is take this equation for the potential, find the equipotential lines, show that they're circles, and furthermore, work out the origin and radius of those circles. Hmm. OK, that's part two. So first of all, we want to set the potential equal to v0, which is going to be a constant. Secondly, we're actually given this quantity p in the question. p is equal to 2 pi epsilon naught v naught over lambda. And what we can see, therefore, is that that's very close to this factor that's actually written here in this expression for the potential. And actually, we can write that 2p is precisely equal to this log. So actually, it turns out that this p that's given to us in the question is just um, all of these constants outside the front of the definition of our potential. And we want to get rid of that uh, and absorb it into something, and we'll call that something p. Well, actually, we're calling it 2p. Um, good. So with this expression in mind, we can now exponentiate both sides and have e to the 2p is equal to, and then e to the log, they cancel. Get this. And what we want to do is show these equipotential lines, which are parameterized by p, which is a constant, uh, because v equals v naught is a constant. We want to show that those equipotential lines parameterized by p are circles. OK, so this is just a question of rearranging this expression a little bit. So let me multiply up this, um, this term that I've just derived here, and I'll get the following. So x minus a squared into two, uh, e to the 2p plus y squared e to the 2p is equal to x plus a squared plus y squared. So that's just sort of multiplying up that expression. Um, let's uh, do a little bit of tidying up and collect these various terms. And what we'll find, and I leave this to you to check this is the case, but just by expanding this out, collecting the terms and dividing by some factor, we'll see the following. And then I have this funny factor, e to the 2p plus 1 over e to the 2p minus 1, and that whole thing is equal to 0. So what I've written down there is really just um, a very straightforward algebraic manipulation of this expression that I've derived. Um, actually, I can make it slightly more simple even, because this factor here that I'm drawing in green is actually... 1 over the hyperbolic tangent of p. That's just the definition of tanch p, or 1 over tanch p. OK, so this is the equation that we've derived uh, for the equipotential lines parameterized by uh, this constant p, which is given in the question. We've supposed to compare this now to the equation of a circle of radius r0 and of origin uh, which is at uh, x naught zero zero. So let's write down the equation for that for that uh, circle. We want the circle of radius r naught and center, uh, which is going to be x naught zero zero. And that equation is x minus x naught squared plus y squared is equal to r naught squared. 
we can now compare those two equations. So first of all, let's just expand out this bracket here. I'll obtain x squared um, plus y squared plus x naught squared minus r naught squared minus 2x naught x equals 0. OK, so that's what I have um, from the equation of the circle. And now I can just compare these two things. And comparing this expression for the equation of the circle with our expression for the equipotential lines, um, I find that a squared is equal to x naught squared minus r naught squared. And I also find that 2x naught is equal to 2a upon the hyperbolic tangent of p. OK, so those 2s also cancel. Get rid of those. And I'm just left with x naught is equal to a upon tangent p. And that is the equation that we were asked to prove in the question. So that's good. What about this equation for um, the radius? So we've worked out the the uh, the origin of the circle. That's x naught. What about the radius? This is not quite in the right form uh, yet, because the radius expression here um, involves something that also depends on x naught. So let's just rewrite this expression a little bit. R naught is going to be equal to the square root of x naught squared minus a squared. Uh, we can plug in our expression for x naught in there, which is going to be a squared over tanch squared of p minus a squared taking out the factor of a squared, and uh, maybe also I take out a factor of tanch squared, so I'll write a upon tanch of p, and that's going to give us now uh, in the square root 1 minus tanch squared p. 1 minus tanch squared is sech squared. We square root it, we get sech. It cancels with the tanch. And finally, after a bit of pain, we end up with a upon shine p, the hyperbolic sine of p. And this is our expression for r naught. So we've successfully derived as desired in the question, an expression for the origin of these equipotential circles and the radius of the equipotential circles. Notice in particular that the origin of these equipotential circles is not just equal to a. This is the, you might have thought that the equipotential circles were centered on the wires at plus and minus a, but that is not the case. Okay, so there was a bit of hard maths, but we got there in the end. Okay, actually the most interesting part of this question is yet to come. C part three is about applying the uniqueness theorem. Let's see how that works. Okay, so here is a summary of what we know so far. If we have two uh, infinite wires running parallel to the, the Z axis, one of charge density plus lambda, one of charge density minus lambda, which are at X positions uh, plus A and minus A respectively, then we have this exact potential written here, which is something that's given in terms of the charge density lambda and the uh, the x uh, sent the x position of the wires, which is a. So they're the physical parameters of this system. Furthermore, we deduced that the equipotential lines, when v is a constant v naught, are circles with radius r naught and x naught, given by these equations. OK, good. So what we want to do with the uniqueness theorem is to consider a different system, which I will call um, system number two. So this is system number one I've written here. Let's look now at system two. 
system two is not two wires, but rather two cylinders. Which I'll sketch here. Never underestimate the use of a good sketch. And these two cylinders, we're told in the question, have sensors which are, uh, we can read from part three of the question here, these sensors are plus and minus d apart. So we'll imagine that this distance here is d and this distance here is d. And they are held at constant potentials this one is at plus V naught, and this one is at minus V naught. So they are, they, these cylinders are supposed to be conductors that are themselves equipotentials. And so the potential is plus V naught on this right hand cylinder and minus V naught on this uh, left hand cylinder. The only other thing we need to know is the radius of these cylinders. The two radii are the same. Um, it's a radius of capital R. Now, the idea is that we can use the uniqueness theorem to work out the potential, the, the full potential in three-dimensional space for our system number two, borrowing the work that we've already done for system number one, which is a much simpler system. It's just two thin one-dimensional wires. System number two is more complicated because we have conductors which are held at an equipotential, but we don't know what their charge density is on the surface of these conductors. In fact, they will be something complicated because there's two uh, metal uh, conductors in proximity. There will, the charges in each of them will, uh, will feel some kind of force, uh, and that's a very complicated system to solve. However, what we know from system number one is that if um, we want uh, an equipotential uh, of, uh, of a, a particular V naught, um, then that's something we actually get from our, um, from our double wire system. So what we want to do is sort of compare these two things. The boundary condition for the potential in system number two is that when we are on these, uh, these circles, in the x, y plane, uh, which uh, define the surface of the cylinders, then we should have a potential V naught. And we can compare that with the equipotential lines of our system number one, where the V equals V naught. So we just have to make um, a few comparisons. We can match the boundary conditions of the two systems. How can we do that? Well, we simply want to let that capital R, the radius of our system number two, of the cylinders on our system number two, we want that to equal the uh, little r naught, the radius of the equipotential lines of our system number one. We also want that the center of our, um, of our cylinders in system number two which is called D, should be the origin or the center of our equipotential circles in system number one. So D is equal to X naught. So this is how we match the boundary conditions between system one and system two, which is that the potential has to be the same um, in both cases. So that's, uh, that's good. What else? Well, we can now um, what we actually need to do in order to write down the potential for system number two is work out what the lambda and the a would be. What we, what we know so far is what r naught and x naught are, but we don't yet know what lambda and a is. So we have to do a little more work to take our expressions for r naught and x naught and extract from them the desired quantity um, of lambda and a. How do we do that? Well, we have to just do a bit of algebraic manipulation, um, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, for example, if I do d divided by r, 
d divided by r is, of course, x naught uh, divided by little r naught. And if I were to use the expressions for x naught and r naught, I would find that d over r is equal to cosh of p. And we know what p is. It's 2 pi epsilon naught v naught over lambda. So if we, we know what the v naught is in system 2, and therefore we have an equation here which allows us to extract what uh, the lambda is. So lambda is, just by inverting that equation, 2 pi epsilon naught v naught over arc cosh of d over r. So you see, in this expression for lambda, I'm only using parameters of system number two. I'm using the physical parameter d, the physical parameter r, the physical parameter v naught. And that allows us to say what the effective line charge density in system one would be lambda. Um, what about the radius a? Well, we know that um, if we take d squared minus r squared of system 2, those are the physical parameters of system 2, then that is equal to x naught squared minus r naught squared. And earlier we showed that that was just equal to a squared. And so we can also work out the physical parameter of system 1, uh, which is a, which follows as the square root of d squared minus r squared, uh, which are the physical parameters of our system number two. Okay, so that's basically it. Uh, we can match the lambda and the a of system one to the parameters of our system two. And uh, in so doing, we guarantee that we'll get the correct potential on the surfaces of our cylinder in system two by modeling it using these uh, two wires in system number one. So to find the potential now, I just have to plug in these values of lambda and a into my equation for the potential. Okay, and this is the final solution. I just plugged in the expression for a and lambda into our expression for uh, the potential, and we see that this now is the potential. Um, for our two cylinders held at different uh, potentials, plus and minus v naught. One small caveat with this, which is that this solution is only valid in the physical region of space um, outside of the cylinders. Why is that? Because the uniqueness theorem tells us that if we have the same charge density in a particular region of space with the correct boundary conditions on the surface of that region of space, then the potential that we have is the correct potential. However, um, if we look at our pair of cylinders system, if we look inside the cylinders, we'd see that the charge density was actually different than in our case of two wires. What we want to do is actually only look in this part of space outside of the cylinders because there we don't have any charges in either system and so the charge density in both cases is the same and the boundary condition, which is the potential on the surface of the cylinders, is matched by the two systems. But I have to pick a region of space where the charge densities match and that actually is only the case when I look outside of the cylinders. Okay, so on to the final question. This is about the electromagnetic field tensor, which is something that comes up in um, the relativistic formulation of electrodynamics. And at the point of doing this assignment, we hadn't actually studied this stuff yet, uh, but that doesn't matter because this question is purely about the mathematical structure. And um, I wanted to do this in this assignment to prepare the way um, so that when we come to studying the actual physics of the relativistic formulation of electromagnetism, the maths doesn't get in the way of understanding the, uh, the concepts because we've already done the maths. So this is the maths. Let's have a look. 
Um, the electromagnetic field tensor F um, uh, mu nu is defined as this object. Now, um, this F is a tensor because it has two indices. Uh, it has these Greek indices mu and nu. For our purposes, in this question, this can just be regarded as a matrix, a four by four matrix, because we have two indices which can, for example, count as the rows and columns of a matrix, and uh, mu and nu are indices that run over four possibilities. Uh, so we basically have a four by four matrix. Now, when we come on to studying the um, the relativistic formulation of electromagnetism, we'll see that all of this has a deeper meaning and something that's a bit more precise. Here, in terms of the maths, it couldn't just be regarded as a matrix. So that's what we're going to do. And the definition of this field tensor is as some anti-symmetric object, and that's actually part A to, to show that this F is anti-symmetric. Um, it involves derivatives of A, um, which is the four potential, the four vector potential. And this four vector potential has four components, the first one of which is the scalar potential, and the other ones, the other comp three components are components of the vector potential, the x, y, and z components of the vector potential. And there's some minus signs and factors of c and so on sprinkled in there for good measure. Also, we have uh, derivatives with respect to x nu, which is the, um, the event in special relativity, which involves time and the three spatial coordinates. Good. Um, so part A, with that preamble said, part A asks us to show that f mu nu is anti-symmetric. And what anti-symmetric means is that f mu nu is equal to minus f nu mu. And that's pretty obvious from the expression, um, or the definition there in equation one. Why is that? Well, let's simply consider um, f nu mu. Um, so I get that from equation one by replacing all the mu's by nu's and all of the nu's by mu's, okay? So that would be dA, and then instead of nu, I write mu, by dx, instead of mu, I write nu, and so on. And that object is obviously just equal to minus of this thing. Uh, which is exactly the definition given in equation one. So that's kind of almost trivial. Uh, it just follows from the definition in equation one. Okay, so without further ado, let's look at part B, which says, uh, let's look at the Bianchi identity. The Bianchi identity involves derivatives of the electromagnetic field tensor F. So we just have to plow through a bit of algebra here. So what I want is this object, and I want to show that that thing is equal to zero. So it's the sum of three terms. Uh, let me just write each of those terms out according to uh, equation one and derivatives therein. Okay, so this is what we get uh, when we expand it all out, and we write these derivatives of f with respect to, to the various parameters uh, of x um, and use the definition 1 for our um, field tensor f. And we see that we have a bunch of second derivatives of our four potential. So this is the expression written out, and then it turns out that we can collect up um, the various terms which uh, then cancel. So for example, if we look at this first term here, that cancels exactly with this term here, because um, the order of these uh, second derivatives doesn't matter. So these, uh, I can do a d squared a gamma by dx alpha dx beta is equal to d squared 
a gamma by dx beta dx alpha. That's because these are smooth differentiable functions and um, this, the second mixed derivatives are equal to each other. So those two terms are equal and cancel. Um, I can also pair up this term and this term. They're equal and they cancel. And finally, I see that this term cancels with this term for the exact same reason. So overall, all of this stuff here is indeed equal to zero. So we'll actually see later on in the course uh, that this Bianchi identity is actually equivalent to two of the Maxwell's equations. Okay, good. The last part of the question. In the last part of the question, we were asked to show that the electromagnetic field tensor F actually can be related to the components of the electric and magnetic fields. Now, to do this, we need to know that the electric and magnetic fields are themselves related to the scalar and vector potential. And the scalar potential phi and the vector potential A are, of course, the components of our four potential A written in uh, in equation one. So how do we do this? Well, let's just, I'll do it for a couple of terms and then you'll be able to see what's going on. So for example, let's look at um, an element F01 of the electromagnetic field tensor. So that's the zeroth row and the first column. From equation one, I have that that's dA1 by dx naught minus dA naught by dx one. And if I uh, look up what the components of A are, and I look up what the components of X are, then I know this is secretly dA x by C dt minus d phi upon C divided by dx. And that object is exactly what we see written there in uh, the definition of the electric field in terms of the potentials, except it's the x component of the electric field. So what we have is exactly, actually it's up, not quite, it's divided by the speed of light c. So what we see is that um, element F01 is equal to the x component of the electric field divided by the speed of light. Good, what about F02? Just to do another example. Um, F02, um, by analogy, turns out to just be the y component of the electric field. again, divided by the speed of light. And it's easy to see that F03 would be the uh, Z component of the electric field divided by um, speed of light. Okay, easy peasy. Let's do one of the other elements, F12. So that's the definition from equation one. We can again convert that into uh, x, y, and z components and the time. And we see this. And that's actually equal to minus bz, the z component of the magnetic field. Why? because the magnetic field is defined as the curl of the vector potential A. And if I work out the curl of the vector potential A, well, let's just do it. Let me just do it over here. Uh, 
The curl is given by this thing, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, the, the determinant of that thing with ax, ay, az. If I want to know the, um, and that whole thing, of course, is the magnetic field B. So if I look at the Z component of that, that's indeed uh, DAY by DX minus DAX by DY, and that's exactly what we see here, or minus that is what we see here. Okay, so we have that kind of stuff. You work through it for all of the components, uh, noting, of course, from part A that the the field tensor is anti-symmetric. So I only have six elements to work out of this four by four matrix. Why is that? Well, a four by four matrix has uh, 16 elements, but because it's anti-symmetric, the diagonal elements have to be equal to zero. So a number equals to minus itself has to be equal to zero. So the four diagonals are equal to zero, and that takes us down to 12 entries. And then the off diagonal elements have to be um, equal to each other, barring a minus sign by reflecting over that diagonal. Okay, so that so overall there's only six independent parameters. And of course, the, the magic of all of this is those six independent parameters are the three components of the electric field and the three components of the magnetic field. So let me just finally write down the result for F mu nu to find from equation one with these various uh, definitions of the vector potential and so on and so forth. And I'm going to write it down in matrix form. And as I mentioned, we have zeros on the diagonal because it's anti-symmetric. We worked out these ones. And we worked out uh, F12, which is minus BZ. And I'll leave it to you to work out that the other elements in here are BY and minus BX. And then, as I explained, because it's anti-symmetric from part A, I can just reflect this onto the other side without doing any more work. Uh, let's get this right. So that's plus bz minus by and plus bx. And that is the electromagnetic field tensor in terms of the electric and magnetic fields. This might seem a bit nuts, um, but this is uh, very rich information here, and we'll be using this extensively when we talk about special relativity. That's all to come. Okay, so I hope you found that useful. That was quite a, a long assignment. Um, but it contained, I think, some really important concepts, and I hope this uh, online tutorial class has helped with that.